Am I deconstructing or full-blown deconverting? Listen, the algorithm on YouTube, Insta, TikTok, they really blur the line and paint a singular narrative, which is this, your faith is destructive. You should pull it apart and even better, maybe you should leave it all behind because all the cool kids are doing it. You ain't cool unless. Yet the reality is that in most people's life, there comes a place where they come face to face with the reality that they have to own their faith for themselves. Or maybe you're just going along in your faith journey and then all of a sudden, boom, something shakes your faith to the core. And in both of these scenarios, there's quite a bit of uncertainty about what we should believe. Well, stick with me today and I'll help you answer this. God, are we still good? Today on church door. So let me say it again. All the cool kids are doing it. That's right. In the most recent years, we've seen massive amounts of people in the spotlight deconstructing or even deconverting from the faith. From Derek Webb to Joshua Harris, Aubrey Assad to Lisa Gunger, seems to be a mass exodus from Christianity. But let me emphasize scenes. This, like other things, online gets amplified and has captured the minds of many like a contagion. The truth is that many who find themselves in this situation dive right into the deconstruction rabbit hole, which lands them in an echo chamber. And that echo chamber literally preys on the appetite for deconstruction information. Now the problem with that is that it's often one-sided. Many people who are deconstructing are just looking for real answers, not the latest celebrity who has went to the dark side. Now I say that with a little bit of tongue in cheek because it's obviously more complex than that. And I think we could see that illustrated in the story of one of the godfathers of YouTube, Rhett McLaughlin. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. Over the past few years, Rhett has publicly been open about his journey of deconstruction, which has ultimately led to his deconversion from Christianity. Here's just a little bit of his story. My deconstruction didn't start with the decision to lean on my own understanding. And honestly, it felt a lot like the opposite of that. When I was a Christian, I spent a lot of time making sure that what I believed was true. And that usually meant going to sources that had arguments that supported what I already believed. But it turns out that was pretty difficult to do without running into ideas that were critical of Christianity because those were the very ideas that I was going to those sources to develop a defense for. And that's when I learned that the bulk of people in a lot of different disciplines, whether that be biology or astronomy, geology, psychology, anthropology, archeology, span neuroscience, and in some cases, biblical studies, had come to conclusions that called my particular conservative evangelical Christian belief system into question. This shook me up a lot. And for the first time in my life, I seriously considered the question, what if I'm wrong? I'd never really done that before. I kept reading and eventually I got to, I think I might be wrong. And then I kept reading some more and eventually I landed on, I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. Now I love how honest he is in this video. Obviously he spent a ton of time opening up and thinking about this and he didn't come to his stance lightly. And as I've watched this clip, there are two things that come to the top of my mind in the discussion of deconstruction. Firstly, Rhett talks about a very specific Christian point of view. I think later in the video, he describes his past self as a 21st century American conservative evangelical Christian. I mean, that is very specific. And truth is, Christianity is much, 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 much wider than that. Temptation for many people in faith is to narrow orthodoxy. What I mean by this is that there are too many Christians that are out there trying to seek a black and white answer about everything that touches their faith. And in reality, that is impossible. Sure, there are timeless truths that the vast majority of Christians agree on, but outside of that, there is a lot of variance when it comes to Christian thought. Now, secondly, 
Rhett puts Christianity in opposition to science and other academic disciplines. Now this one seems to have been beaten into the minds of our culture, that faith and science are like oil and water. Yet here is my pushback. The Bible and faith are not meant to prove science. Certainly the Bible complements these things, but the Bible's not meant to be a source of mathematics or science or biology, you name it. Now, what is the Bible? It's a collection of books that chronicle the story of God with humanity. And in these books, we see three main types of literature. The first being narratives, whether it be a historical narrative, theological or biographical. But we also see poetry and prose within the scriptures. Many find themselves falling into a trap where they expect the Bible to be either one, speaking on something that it was not trying to speak to. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Or number two, fighting a temptation to try and fit scripture into every other academic pursuit in order to prove it's right. This was never the intent of scripture. The Bible speaks to its own category, spiritual life, to the metaphysical reality lying behind the physical world we exist in. Now you might say, Ian, you know what? I'm not convinced. I'm barely holding on to my faith. That's why I'm calling today's message, God, are we still good? So here is what is at stake for many who start on this journey of deconversion. It can quickly become like your faith is just holding on by a single thread. Like it's on the express train to complete and utter deconversion. I mean, do you remember my last message? If you haven't watched it, I'll put it down into the description. And in that video, I said definitions, definitions are important. And I would like to pose a term that many Christians have suggested in the place of the term deconstruction, reformation. Actually, in the arc of Christian history, it's a highly important word. In the case of Martin Luther, he started a movement. And that movement challenged items within the church that didn't harmonize with his deeply held faith. And many who came to follow his movement would tout this phrase, Ecclesia Reformata, Semper Reformata. That is, the church reformed, always reforming. For them, this was according to the word of God and to the call of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus wasn't afraid of this mindset. He actually spoke about it in one of his parables, and actually my favorite parable that he spoke of. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And it starts by saying this, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property and reckless living. In this parable, we see three characters. There's a father, in this case representing God, two sons and one of them who was wayward and the older son who represented some of the religious zealots in Jesus's day. This story starts with the son saying to his dad, you know what, dad, I want my inheritance because I want to go do what I want to do. And notice that the father did not deny this request, which was absolutely unprecedented. This request would have been like a slap in the face, it's almost like saying, you know what, dad, I wish you were dead so I could have my inheritance. Does this sound familiar? Can any of us identify with the younger son? You know, a lot of times we want our way. We want the world to bend us. Yet again, the father did not deny the request. And why? Here's my first thought. God is a gentleman. Christian YouTuber Leighton Flowers says it like this. God is in control, but not controlling. If you're in a season of life where you find yourself reforming your faith, Know this, God is graciously letting you wrestle with that. And for me, this speaks to free will. God does not want us to blindly come to him out of obligation, but out of our full choice to embrace him as he is, our Father, God, Creator. Now the story continues by the son squandering his inheritance. And in other words, he found out that his way really didn't work out for him. And in that revelation, he realizes, you know what, maybe I can go back to the Father. He had my best interest in mind and maybe he'll let me be a servant. So he starts back home and the Father, out of elation, seeing his son in the distance, goes running to him and embraces him. And what else does he do? 
he throws him a party. Now, on the other hand, this doesn't make the older son happy. The scripture says this, but he, the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came who devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and now is alive. He was lost and is found. So if the first son teaches us that God is a gentleman who allows us to wander and doubt and maybe make some mistakes, what does the second son teach us? I think it's this. God wants a relationship, not just religious adherence. In these scriptures, we see that the older son has every box checked for the father religiously, yet he was not close enough to the father to carry out his same heart for the younger son. Ultimately, God wants to know you intimately. He doesn't just want your allegiance. Matter of fact, he doesn't need you at all. Huh? But he wants to have a relationship with you. Therefore, he is willing to take the risk, letting us doubt, letting us wonder that we could truly see our need for his grace. And this grace is only a grace that the father can provide in the close relational quarters of his kingdom. So here's the thing, friends. If we learn one thing from this parable, it's this, that whether you're in the castle or you're far from the castle, the father that resides in it wants to have a relationship with you. There are people who go to church week after week. They know religiously with their head what the truth is, but it has not captured their hearts. They have not been chasing after the Father because they desire to love and serve Him. Wherever you find yourself today, far from God, chasing whatever you think is right, or in His kingdom, still not close and in an intimate, loving relationship with Him, we want to show you how to get closer to Him. We have a team of people here that would love to help you do that. You can reach us down in the comments, or you can text prayer to the number you see coming up on the screen right now. Help us promote great Christian content by hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell so that every single time we put out a piece of content, it's going to come directly to you. Or you can go the extra mile by going to rivervalleyrockford.org slash give and making a donation there. Every single cent that comes in goes right back out, helping people just like you take their next step with Jesus. Our blessings are upon you this week. If you find yourself in a place of doubt, listen, God wants to struggle with you through these things. He allows you to go through them, that you might freely come to him for a relationship with the one who's created you. Hey, listen, the encouragement doesn't have to stop here. We got one more video for you that I think will help you out in this next week. Enjoy.